Brain Carton Podcast. Back again, we had the NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series at New Hampshire, and we had the IndyCar Series in Toronto this weekend for their street race. Uh, trucks were off, Formula One off. We also had the ARCA race at Iowa, which ARCA is the closest you'll get to multi-class racing when it comes to stock cars. You have your halves, your William Swalich's, the Venerini cars, and um, Luke Finthouse and the, I think the 28 cars, what he's in now. They're really fast. And then you have the Wayne Peterson cars and the 11 car of, I think, Zachary Tinkle is in it again this weekend. They're not fast. And when I say they're not fast, I mean, like, they're 107% rule not fast. They're not even within seven seconds fast. I believe it was lap four when they started putting cars a lap down at Iowa. Iowa's a, what, a seven-eighths mile track. Four laps over seven-eighths of a mile, you do the math, they're very far off the pace. And uh, it, it was it was something. They had their own little battle going on. Uh, it remind it, it's the Ricky Bobby clip, right? What was that? Those are the other cars, uh, and he's freaking out. That's exactly what happened. When the fast cars go by, they look like they're sitting still. Very dangerous. Very random tangent to get off on the start here, but that's what you come here for. That's what Break Hard Podcast is. It's my my dumb brain, and we're gonna talk about it. I'm not gonna apologize for the hair. It's is what it is today. <laughs> I did concrete work yesterday, that concrete dust. I didn't get around to washing my hair yet. I went swimming afterwards, chlorine, concrete dust. Woke up this morning, logged right on, did some work, watched this race on Monday afternoon. It is what it is, getting washed tonight. Either way, I digress. We had Martin Trucks Jr. finally win at another one of his home racetracks. New Hampshire actually maybe does not actually fall into one of his home race tracks, but he's a Northeast guy, so we're just going to consider it one of his home tracks. Dominated the race. Absolutely was never really in question from the start. Uh, I don't know if Racing Reference is going to have the... Um, have the finishing order up yet because it's Racing Reference. Oh, they do. The Cray Crayon 301 which did result in a message in our group chat, which was very fair from somebody who's listening on the radio today while they're working. They said, is this like the art supply? <laughs> which is totally fair, Zach, completely understand it. And I just, I thought the same thing at first when I saw it <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. I think that's why everybody had to ask and be like, what is this? Also, if you're this company, why would you name your company that? I guess it does work out really well for like organic search hits. But still, like, if you're looking up Crayola crayons, why would you look up... Whatever. Doesn't matter. Regardless, Martin Truex Jr. wins the race, leads 254 of 301 laps. You can do the math at home. It's a shit ton of laps. So he wins the race. The only other car to lead... Oh, no, sorry. We got two cars that led double-digit laps. Kevin Harvick led 10, and Austin Dillon led 12 both during pit stop sequences. Really abysmal day in terms of one driver being the dominant one. Good day in terms of racing though. I, in my opinion from, I had, I had it on the TV in the office here. I'm pointing off screen. You can't see it. Doesn't matter. I'm not turning the camera. Had it on the TV in the office. And from what I saw as I'm trying to multitask was not bad. Not the best, not the best that we've ever seen, but New Hampshire's never really provided fantastic racing. I guess maybe in the mid-2000s it kind of did, uh, when front-end downforce wasn't like the biggest factor in the world. But at the same time, I thought it was okay. It had 3,100 green flag passes. That doesn't necessarily mean anything at all when you factor in the, um, when you factor in green flag pit stops. But last year's race only had 1,500. So there's that. It had nine cautions last year uh, for 52 laps, eight cautions for 41 laps this year. Cautions do help out with the uh, green flag passes stat because of restarts and the jockeying for position. So, I mean, it did work. It was better. The short track package has seemed to work on... Richmond was not bad. It was it, got, it was better than last year. I would say New Hampshire is definitely better than last year. It has not worked at Martinsville. Martinsville was not very good. 
and Phoenix was also not very good as well, which is kind of surprising because Phoenix races a lot like Richmond and even Loudon to a lesser extent. So it is kind of surprising there. I guess we'll see what happens when we get to Bristol uh, in later in the summer in the playoffs and see how it races at that track. It is very sad that we can just list like the short tracks and be like, oh yeah, it's just Richmond, Martinsville, um, New, Ham New Hampshire doesn't have even a short track, uh, Bristol, and Phoenix. Like what? What are we doing, man? It's a bummer. Obviously, the test did not happen that they were going to run the uplift splitter. That will now happen at Richmond after the race in two weeks from now. So, obviously, with the rain out, got pushed back to today being one of those test days and tomorrow. And teams have to get their cars back now to Pocono. And the teams need to go back, prep the cars, go to Pocono. And, uh, yeah, it just makes total sense to, to delay it. It is a bummer. I think there's a lot of people that were hopeful for this. I'm really interested to see what comes out of it. It's supposed to help cars in traffic, <clears throat> which is what they need. So we'll see if it does help out in the long run. Either way, though, Martin Truex Jr. wins the race. Joe Ligon a second. Kyle Larson uh, third. Kevin Harvick fourth. Brad Keselowski fifth. Really strong day for Brad. Didn't have race winning speed, but definitely had speed to contend and speed to... Let everybody know he was there. Like, they were top five on speed. His spotter, TJ Majors, was home sick. Hopefully, he's fine. His brother, Brian uh, Keselowski, spotted for him. Always love when, like, you get that little family connection in there. Tyler Reddick finished sixth. Denny Hamlin, seventh. Bubba Wallace, eighth. Austin Dillon, ninth. And Chase Briscoe in tenth. He, tr he tried his best to wreck some people today, Chase Briscoe did. He just didn't get it done. Uh, Eric Jones rebounded for an 11th place finish. Qualified 30th, spun out. And still finishes in 11th place. Huge rebound uh, for him. Chase Elliott, again, had a pretty decent rebound because they were dog shit early. He finishes 12th uh, on a day that he desperately needed points, and he did not get any stage points. I still think he can point his way in, but he is entering desperation mode at this point. He's not in the top 21 in points. He is... Uh, I need to check... NASCAR's website because racing reference again just doesn't have it but the uh, current playoff standings Martin Truex Jr. is the leader currently because of his oh he's literally just the points leader at the moment that's why okay I was looking at this like what the hell is going on here um Chase Elliott is 60 points below the cutoff line. I'll be honest, that's that's tough. That's a race behind right now. Um, not a full, almost a full race behind if you max out points. I guess it is a full race behind if you max out points. But it's, it's going to be tough. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the points right now. He needs nine points to get ahead of Cindric. He needs 14 to get ahead of Haley, 18 to get to Bowman, 19 to get to Ty Gibbs, 41 to get to, or no, 40 to get to Almendinger. Oh, man. But the cutoff line is very tight right now. Plus one is Michael McDowell in 16th. Plus two is Bubba Wallace in 15th. Daniel Suarez is minus one in 17th. That's a tight battle right there. And, um... I guess, yeah, we still have five spots open to non-winners. I still think we get another winner out of this group. I think that Bubba Wallace has shown speed, that he can get this done. I wouldn't be shocked to see Alex Bowman find his way to victory lane. I know everybody's going to be like, he's not running great. Yeah, and then he just shows up. He's very streaky, and he'll just show up and win a race. Chase Elliott today, they just looked really bad. Now we're heading to Pocono. He did win Pocono last year after Denny got disqualified, so maybe some of his Chase Elliott fans can find solace in that. You head to Richmond, where his car finished second at in the uh, spring with Josh Berry. Um, we can maybe say that he's going to have an okay run there, or at least a chance. And then you go to Michigan after that. I think that's kind of a toss-up, really, at this point. And then you have... 
the road course at Indianapolis, 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 what the heck, uh, Watkins Glen <clears throat> after that, and then the playoff cutoff race at Daytona, which that's a wild card and can go to anybody, as we saw last year. So we'll see what happens going forward, but I don't know, man. Chase is, Chase is broken right now. I don't know if they're going to find it, but he is, um, he's got to do something because they've just been bad, and uh, I know all the Chase Elliott fans have a lot to say about it, and uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. Nate's here. Hello, sir. You you need to lay down, please. Hey, Nathan. Nate. 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 All right, lay down. Okay. Can you lay down? Nope. Okay. You gotta lay down, please. Nate, this is very bad podcasting. Can you lay down? God damn. Okay. All right, we're just not laying down. He'll get down in a minute. We'll deal with this. Ryan Blaney appeared to have a pretty good... Why would you eat that? Drop drop it. It's it's literally... Okay. Ryan Blaney uh, had a really good run going. Probably had a top three car. Chokes it away. Runs over some pit stop equipment late in the race. Basically doomed his entire day from that point. Uh, had to restart at the rear late. Leave it. And that was the end of his day, which is unfortunate for him. But it just feels like every time that team gets close, they kind of hit on something. And this is a this was a track in a weekend where Fords finally showed up, right? Like Ford, all we hear about is how Ford's struggling, Ford's struggling. And then they show up, Logano finishes second, Blaney probably should have finished in the top three. You have Harvick in fourth, Brad Keselowski in fifth, and Chase Briscoe in tenth. And Chase Briscoe's team, they've been getting outran by the 15 and the 51 of Rick Ware Racing more often than not this year. So for them to show up, like, you know that Ford is better on like these flat tracks obviously Logano won the championship last year at Phoenix so they do have this sort of figured out a little bit it's just really disheartening I imagine if you're a Blaney fan that you just constantly have to deal with just this team shooting itself in the foot week in and week out super frustrating uh, for them on the other hand you have Kyle Busch had a weekend to forget he hit the wall three times he hit the wall in practice, he hit the wall in qualifying, he hit the wall in the race. Just an absolutely abysmal weekend for those boys on a week, on a time really that I didn't expect them to struggle this bad. Like even Austin Dillon got a top 10 out of the day and not for nothing, Austin Dillon isn't half the driver that Kyle Busch is. So a bit surprising there. I wonder if they were just trying too much or if he was trying too hard, but very uncharacteristic of Kyle Busch to have three incidents in the same week, and that all resulted in, like, pretty decent damage. Two of them definitely um, resulted in pretty bad damage. Ty Gibbs and Alex Bowman might have a budding rivalry uh, going earlier in the race. Uh, the 54 clears the 48 into turn three, and then basically just scoots up into his lane and then stops in the middle of turn four because he needed to get his car turned. The 48 is already back to the gas. He rolls up. And he just kind of punches him in the back bumper. No harm, no foul. Like, didn't spin him out, didn't do anything. And then Ty goes down into the corner, and in typical, like, Ty Gibbs Silver Spoon fashion, like, almost wrecks the 48. And it causes him to check up. I believe there's a caution for that incident as well. Yeah, for lap 281. Just really dumb. Really just like, what? The. The repayment didn't meet, didn't match what like was already handed out. The punishment didn't fit the crime in a sense, except there's no crime committed. It was just Ty rolling up, slowing down, and then just getting popped. And it's like, why, why did the 48 of Bowman deserve to get hit? Anyways, very dumb there. I didn't understand that, but we'll have to keep an eye on that going forward and see what happens uh, with those two. Eric Almarola. Looked like, again, another guy that probably should have had a top three finish. He may have had race winning speed. Mm, I would argue that it's Eric Almarola. Although, I mean, two years ago, he did win this race in a shocking fashion uh, that surprised everybody. So there's at least that. Was it? Yeah, I guess it was two years ago. Um, his team, he asked them after the pit stop, he said, did you get the wheel tight? And they said, yes. He goes out there. 
guess what? Wheel wasn't tight. Crashes, radios the team and said, what happened? And Drew Blickensberg's crew chief said, wheel wasn't tight. I mean, what the fuck are we even doing here, guys? <laughs> like, how does that even happen? How do you get that messed up on this? And you're like, oh, this is... We lied. We just lied. Eric Almarola's day was finished. Probably the last legitimate shot he has at winning a race outside of Daytona and Talladega coming up this year. And I would imagine that his cup career likely ends without a win in his final season. Uh, what's rumored to be his final season, I guess we'll wait and find out. Michael McDowell's just sitting by waiting too. Like, hey buddy, you want to retire and I'll take your seat. Not sure if it's better than where he's at right now, which is kind of a wild statement, but is what it is. Christopher Bell got into the wall at a racetrack that Christopher Bell just always seems to win at. So that was uncharacteristic of him. Did not end up winning the race, clearly, because Martin Truex Jr. won. But he did manage to finish poorly. Where did Christopher Bell finish? 29th. Poorly. First car, one lap down. Not ideal for him. That caution came out, though, with... 11 laps to go, so that's why he had no time to rebound. Oh, I gotta stop opening up that tab. Ryan Priest and Michael McDowell. I, the, a lot happened for a race that like probably 18 people saw. Ryan Priest and Michael McDowell got into it on the racetrack after the race. McDowell sitting in the window of his car, and Priest walks up, tells him maybe the what for, gives him a little bit of a soccer push. It's the same guy that says every driver out there needs their asses kicked after Coda. He decides to give a soccer push because that's a business move. You don't throw punches unless you're willing to fight. And I would argue that I think Ryan Priest might be more bark than he is bite. I'm not here to find out, though. But he gives McDowell the little soccer push like they do when they're in that little scuffle before the refs come in and have to like break them up to make them feel like they actually did something. So he's walking back to the garage area. McDowell, he, he puts on his running shoes and he gallops over there like a, the horse that he is. And Priest was taken aback by it. He kind of jumped because, again, I think he's a lot of bark. And uh, he didn't really want to hear what McDowell had to say. McDowell apologized. Cooler heads seemed to prevail and they, they walked off together. Good news for, Pre for Ryan Priest is Michael McDowell apparently doesn't take much to get knocked to the ground. Daniel Suarez did it with relative ease. Uh, the bad news is Michael McDowell's crew is very good at putting drivers on the hood of the car, though, immediately after. So you got to weigh and kind of survey the situation uh, before you decide to make a move. Outside of that, they seem to be fine. There is like a really strong rumor that Michael McDowell could end up at Stuart Haas Racing next year. So I think Michael McDowell made a business decision there. And he's like, I'm going to clear this up before anything happens because I may be working with this guy on a full time basis next year and in the same comp meetings. If you would have told people five years ago that the future lineup of Stuart Haas Racing in 2024 would be Josh Berry, Chase Briscoe, Ryan Priest, and Michael McDowell, they would have laughed at you because they would have expected marquee names to be in those cars. And instead, you are kind of getting like this misfit fancier version of like a front row motorsports. And that's not to knock on any other driver talent. I think Josh Berry is incredibly talented. Chase Briscoe is obviously a cup race winner, but hasn't really done much outside of that one win. And then you have guys like Priest, who's here because he brings some money, and they just thought that he'd be better than Cole Custer, and you can argue that one either way. And then like a guy like Michael McDowell, I, I think he might bring a little bit of money, but you're hiring for his experience. This is the same team, though, that right now could have the lineup of Kevin Harvick, Chase, no, well, hang on a second. They could have the lineup of Kevin Harvick, Kyle Larson, Kyle Busch, and then I would assume maybe Chase Briscoe fills out that four seat. That That's three generational talents you could have in your cars. Kevin Harvick, generational talent, continually outdrives his equipment. Kevin Harvick's literally in the same situation now that he was in at RCR when he left. He's having to drive the absolute piss out of these cars to get anything out of them. Uh, to get a decent result out of them, I should say. Same thing he was doing at RCR. You have Kyle Larson. I think we all agree. Generational talent. Cup champion. Could have had him. Ford decided, no, 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 you can't do that. Kyle Busch. Could have had him. Ford decided, we don't want to take on KBM. Beside, outside of that. If you're Stuart Haas Racing, and you're Tony Stewart, 
you got to be looking around to another manufacturer and being like, does anybody else want to join this sport? Can we go to Chevy? Can we do anything right now? Because Ford has, in a sense, Ford's killed this team. Ford has no driver development pipeline. No offense to Riley Herbst. He's not winning cup races. Zane Smith has signed to Front Row Motorsports. That was a business decision by Zane and his team, but Ford should have stepped in and been like, sign a contract with Ford. We'll delegate you out to which team we think needs you or you fit the best at. And instead, like Tony Stewart and Gene Haas have let Ford drive this team right into the ground. And it's not all them. It's a lot of the business model at Stewart Haas Racing as well. Right? Like, they rely on funded drivers. That's the reason Eric Almirola has that seat. But that seat being funded by Eric Almirola helps subsidize some of the other seats there. They relied too much on Kevin Harvick as well. Stuart Haas Racing has only ever been one good car with three cars just kind of flanking it back. Like, mid-teens. Or low 20s. They just have never really had, like, a strong four-car operation like a Hendrick has or a Gibbs has had. Uh, they just have never done it. So, that's... Very frustrating, I think, if you're a Ford fan or a Stuart Haas racing fan in general. But yeah, back to the actual race, So No Gragson hit the wall again. Uh, he definitely wishes it was the offseason. I think everybody at Legacy Motor Club probably does wish it was the offseason because they're in a lame duck year. They're not getting any support from Chevy. They're not getting the same sim time as anybody else. They're not getting shared setups. They're not getting anything. Everybody's just riding this out until they switch over to TRD next year. And it just kind of feels like a lost season for both Eric Jones and Noah Gragson. Really unfortunate Noah Gragson's rookie season has to come with this. However, I guess you can take some sort of hope in the fact that you're looking at next year and being like, Toyotas are running well pretty much everywhere now. We're going to have that same equipment next year. We're going to have access to the information that TRD gives to JGR and 2311. And it should help out. Should is the key word there. I'm not sure if it will, but like obviously both of those guys came up through TRD's development program. So you have to think that things will get better for them. I hope so at least because sheesh, it's been bad over there for a while. Basically the season. They had a really good season last year, but yeah, it, it just hasn't been very good. So overall, solid day of racing at New Hampshire. Kind of unfortunate that had to happen on a Monday though. First ever rain out at New Hampshire though which is kind of interesting. Uh, I think Ryan Shurex Jr. tweeted out a picture of Martin and them at New Hampshire back when they were kids, which is kind of cool to now see it come full circle and him win the race. I realize he's not a junior. It's just a joke. But it's um, it's cool to see. The Hendrick cars today, the 24 car out to lunch, P24. And then you have Bowman in 14th, Elliott in 12th, and Larson in 3rd. Larson definitely um, definitely had to make things happen, right? So it's – they – he even said after the race, he's like, good result for a track that's not very good for at, for Hendrick Motorsports. And it just really isn't. I can think of a Mark Martin win there off the top of my head. They, they just don't win there as often as they do uh, at other tracks. And if I cared enough to look it up, I actually would. But – we got things to talk about for the rest of this. All right, moving on to the Xfinity race on sa Saturday. John Hunter Nemechek goes back-to-back -back like he's on the cover of Lethal Weapon. Finally got to use the line after last week, having to look up all the fucking Rocky. Whatever. Um, he goes back-to-back. -back. He did. He definitely caused a big accident on a restart. Absolutely caused a big accident. Regardless of what Jeff Burton says, Jeff Burton will just never be critical of anybody in the booth. Because, one, he wants to be, like, buddy-buddies with them. He's part of the, the RTA, um, or the Driver's Council, whatever the fuck it's called. He never wants to be, like, overly critical. And his, his son raced for JGR, so, you know, you've always got to keep some bridges open there. But John Hunter definitely caused the stack-up, which resulted in Parker Kligerman and Justin Allgaier getting involved. And their days at the, at the time seemed like they were ruined. But Allgaier rebounded for, I think, a top-six finish. I'll have to double check that. But overall, like it was a good race. But again, John Hunter's out here wreaking havoc. And everybody's like, well, you know, that's just, that's not on John Hunter at all. And it's like, no, it is on John Hunter. Like he's controlling the restart. He 
launched a tad, backed it down, and then waited until he was outside of the restart zone to restart. And by that point, like you jump, boom, and go, and it causes that accordion effect all the way back through the field. Great hand motions here. And it just caused a big accident. So it is what it is. He um, definitely benefited from those C-Bell setups because that car was, again, kind of on rails all day. It led 137 of 206 laps because it went to overtime. Chandler Smith finishes second. Austin Hill finishes third. Daniel Hemrick fourth. Sammy Smith in fifth. Justin Allgaier in sixth. Jeb Burton seventh. Josh Williams eighth. Brett Moffitt ninth. And Mason Massey driving the 08 car for Bobby Dodder comes home in tenth. Sam Mayer should have had a top 10 finish. Sammy Smith just decided that he shouldn't, though, so he gave him a, a nice big bump uh, on the restart there, spun him out, which was kind of uncalled for, definitely uncalled for, and uh, sent him for a spin. Chandler Smith did one of the dumber things you'll ever see somebody do in a race car. Didn't get called out for it for whatever reason, probably because his parents just buy him every seat, so everybody's like, well, it doesn't matter if we say anything bad. Somebody's going to pick up that check anyways. But he um, he goes down into the corner and causes... A, so, okay. Brandon Jones had this great save, thanks to Chandler Smith, on a restart. They're three wide. I think it was on a restart. I could be wrong. But they're three wide. Chandler Smith decides to go all the way against the inside wall down the front stretch, put them four wide into the corner, clearly knowing he's not going to be able to make that turn into the corner, washes up, hits the nine car, sends him for a spin he saves it but josh barry running now fourth on the outside four wide on the outside gets this chain reaction all the way up and gets a tire rub on it all because chandler smith causes this big accident and nobody wants to be critical of it but like it's the same thing that logano did at the indianapolis road course last year and everybody was losing their shit over that same thing that we saw happen at coda earlier in the year where guys are just going all the way down the inside knowing that they aren't going to make the corner and just relying on the car on the outside of them to just play bumper cars and go off of that. But Chandler Smith does that and everybody's like, eh, you know, it is what it is. Very frustrating to see that. Zero criticism from the booth, once again, because we just don't criticize anybody. Uh, unless, I mean, Boyer and Mike Joy did criticize people this year, so I will give them that. But, like, a Jeff Burton, never going to criticize people. Dale will criticize from time to time. Steve Letarte never will. And Rick Allen... He's just he's just happy to be there. I don't know who that number is. Um, but yeah, that's it was really frustrating to see good runs for guys get ruined by just a kid doing something incredibly stupid. But, you know, I guess he's got another kid on the way, so he's got to start winning races and paying for it somehow. Or he has to go ask mom and dad for something. Sam Smith dumped Sam Mayer. We talked about that. And then coming to the white flag, Cole Custer... Just straight up hooked Sheldon Creed. That's, I mean, that's the best way I can put it. Hooked him coming off the corner, caused a big accident. I don't think Cole Custer is going to get a suspension for it because I don't think it was malicious, but it definitely wasn't ideal. I mean, you don't ever want to hook somebody in the middle of the straightaway, essentially. Obviously, they were coming off the corner. But, yeah, kind of a perplexing accident and uh, a really uncalled for one at that. It involved um, just the two and the double zero, but I guess if you're Cole, you've got two wins, so you don't have to worry about it. But Sheldon, he's got no wins. He's, but Sheldon has zero wins, and he's really got to worry about it. So yeah, I didn't didn't love that from um, from old Cold Custer there, but uh, that's just kind of racing now, right? It's super frustrating, but kind of is what it is, as they say. John Hunter f is still the points leader. Let me look at the playoff cutoff line here. Riley Herbst holds an 18-point advantage over Parker Kligerman. They literally have the same amount of top fives and top tens. That's kind of wild. Um, but, yeah, they both have a stage win. So, yeah, uh, I'm not sure anything's going to happen to Cole Custer. If it does, I guess we'll find out tomorrow. But I haven't really heard too many people being like that. Some crazy people on Twitter are like, oh, you got to suspend him for it. But they're just crazy people on Twitter. So, it is what it is. Xfinity Series is off to Pocono next weekend. It'll be a Saturday doubleheader with Trucks and Xfinity uh, both running. We also have an IndyCar race on that Saturday. Pretty packed Saturday, actually, now that I think about it. And you have Formula 1 qualifying in the morning. Uh, they will also be there. Cup Series will be there on Sunday. 
So yeah, looking forward to, not always looking forward to a Pocono weekend, but Pocono at times on the cup side will deliver some interesting races. Uh, I say that, that's just, this is me like projecting, hoping that we'll see something interesting. I actually have not that much faith in it, but I'm holding out some hope here. Uh, outside of that, Truck Series absolutely should never have gone to Pocono. They shouldn't be at Pocono. They should never go to Pocono. Kyle Busch will be in that race, kind of expecting him to win, uh, if we're being honest. But Truck Series shouldn't be at Pocono. Truck Series should be at South Boston or Salem, Winchester. I don't care. Any local short track. That's where the Truck Series should be. Truck Series. Man, that was a hard one for a second. I have no idea why. But... We'll tune in for that uh, on, next week at Pocono, and then they're off to Richmond. This is really like a run of three mediocre mid-races, if we're being completely honest. It's just not the best. Summer stretch, they know they know what the people are doing in the summer, and it's not always tuning in to watch races. So they're going to put some, some real snoozers on at times. All right. IndyCar in Toronto, we had Christian Lungard finally wins his first race. I say finally, he's in his second full season uh, with RLL. Gets Ray Hall Letterman Lane again, back to victory lane for the first time since 2020, when Takuma Sato took them to victory at the Indianapolis 500. Overall, really, really good race, top to bottom. I was just kind of thinking what I was going to say. Really good race, top to bottom. Lungar gets the win. Finally gets to shave the mustache off. Looked great all weekend. Qualified on pole. In the race, just executed flawlessly. They looked like a team that... They showed their potential earlier in the year when they got the pole at the Indianapolis Road Course. We knew they could find speed. Now that they have, now it's like... Now you have to sustain this speed. And I think that they will, at least on the Lungard car. Uh, Jack Harvey's car, Jack's out at the end of the year. Who they put in that car yet, whether that's going to be Marcus Erickson, Felix Rosenquist, or somebody else, Linus Lundquist, I don't know. But that car, we're just not even going to talk about that car. The 15 has shown speed as well, though, with Graham Rahal. He started last, and I believe came home to finish in the... Uh, oh, I thought I had it pulled up already. Dang it, guys. Oh, I do. Okay. But he came home to finish in ninth. So he started 27th. Obviously, at the start of the race there on lap one, there's a pile up uh, just after turn one. Graham realized what happened because he was running last. So he saw it. Track was blocked. Throws that bad boy into reverse like he's Terry. And backs up, drives through the Princess Gate because Canada's part of the Commonwealth. So there is a monument, I guess we'll call it. Uh, drives through there, through the access road, basically out onto a public street for half a second. Uh, there were a, there were fences or, you know, uh, jersey barriers up, but not not like a FIA grade catch fence. He manages to get back out on track, but he gained like six spots in the process because tied up in that accident was like Ryan Hunter Ray, Canadian Ryan Hunter Ray, half Canadian, uh, Tom Blumquist subbing for Simon Pagano, both. Uh, Foyt cars and Ferrucci and Benjamin Peterson and Jack Harvey. So I think he gained five spots there. Uh, that helped project propel him onto a top 10. They have speed. The 15 car does have speed. They just need to get the race together. The 45 car, or yes, the 45 car does have the speed, the race pace, and everything to put it together and end up winning the race. He wins the race. Uh, super impressive drive by Christian Lungard, and I think those going to be more to come from that. I don't think that they're on win every week basis yet in terms of, of uh, performance, but I think that I wouldn't be shocked if he wins again before the end of the year, which for RL, RLL, that's a step in the right direction. They haven't won multiple races since 2019, I believe, with, um, with Takuma Sato. Let me find out real quick, because I looked at this earlier, but then I forgot. IndyCar race results. Let's look through here real quick, shall we? Yes, 2019, Takuma Sato, he won at Barber, and he also won at Gateway. The year prior, he won at Portland. Um, has Takuma Sato won more? Nope. Damn. Takuma Sato's got three. 
four wins. Oh, that's very close. He's got four wins at RLL. And Graham Rahal, who's been there since 2013, has five wins. Either way, still a very good race. Alex Polo didn't win his fourth race in a row. Proves that he's a mere mortal. Helmut Marko is no longer interested in him because he didn't win once again and because he's immortal and because I think Helmut Marko might just be um, a vampire. So he uh, doesn't get that. Doesn't get it done. Finishes second with a front wing that was falling right off. It was just bouncing on the uh, right side of the car, just dragging on the ground, bouncing over all the bumps. You could clearly see it was only being held on by like the driver's left pin in the nose. Somehow manages to get it home without it falling off. I would imagine if they didn't have aero screens, IndyCar black flags them for that because it was very dangerous. But he... um. He manages to come home second again uh, for a day that we thought might not be the best. He he raced Sunday like a guy that's racing for a championship. Obviously, he already has one, but there was a moment where he could have pressured uh, Grosjean and you know maybe bodied him to get around him. Decided not to do it, let Grosjean go, and got passed by Herta in the process. Herta then you know gets by Grosjean, and then Polo sees his opportunity. Did the old Daniel Ricardo lick the stamp and sent it, knowing that I think Grosjean was just going to give him the position. Speaking of Roman Grosjean, wrecked again. The ever evergreen tweet for Grosjean and his crashes got posted because all this guy does is crash. And it, it, he doesn't have a contract next year for IndyCar yet. I don't know if he's going to end up back at Andretti because at this point, Michael can find anybody to go wreck a race car. I mean, Devlin's not wrecking race cars, but. Andretti's only interested in hiring drivers. They don't want paid drivers anymore. Sorry, Devlin. He's out. But if they have two open seats in the 29 and the 28, like, there's some guys out there they could go get. And it'll be interesting to see if they do try to do that and if they don't re-up Grosjean or if he tries to go somewhere else. He also does have a contract signed next year with Lamborghini to drive their hypercar in the World Endurance Championship in the WEC series. Would he just do that full-time? Maybe. Has he moved his whole family to Miami, so obviously he's kind of committed to this stuff stateside, but at the same time, like, you can always move back, right? So we'll see what happens, but the Roman Grosjean experiment definitely hasn't done that well. He complains a lot on the radio. He was seeing ghosts out there on Sunday. He said, I just don't know what happened. Wheel came out of my hands. Not what you want to hear out of a race car driver. His job is to literally steer a car. That's his job. Keep his hands on the wheel, and then his hands just come off the wheel. So, not ideal from him. IndyCar is back in action next week. Iowa doubleheader. I guess if you just want to go ahead and chalk it up for a Joseph Newgarden double victory, I wouldn't complain, I or wouldn't stop you, because I think that's what may end up happening, barring something wild going on. But we'll tune in, because we never know what happens. So... All of that happened this week. Donnie Schatz won the King's Royal. Logan Schuhart won the Eldora Million on Thursday night. I love dirt racing. I do. I have flow racing. I watch a lot of dirt racing. I'll never buy Dirt Vision. That's just... I can't justify the spend on that because I don't have the time to watch all of that. But I will say Eldora had 100 laps of feature racing over the course of four days this weekend this weekend, they had zero passes for the lead in those 100 laps, and that's a major problem. Saturday night during the Kings Royal, turns one and two got torn up, and to the point where two cars flipped just because of how rough the track was. Not ideal there. Casey Kane brought home a top 10. Uh, like I said, Logan Schuhart won the Eldora Million, and then doesn't even make it into the... King's Royal, and then you have Brad Sweet, missed the feature for the first time, I think, in his World of Outlaws career, doesn't advance the feature to race for the King's Royal on Saturday night. Very odd. Kyle Larson drove from 15th to 5th, I believe, was where he finished at. The racing outside of the lead was pretty good. The Eldora Million guys were definitely doing things that they probably wouldn't do on a normal basis just because they wanted to win this race, but yeah, I thought both events were great. Uh... Love to see the Eldora Million come back next year. 
or I don't know if they're going to alternate between late models and sprint cars, or they're going to take a year off. I don't really know, but I thought it was a worthwhile event. Uh, great for flow racing. My only complaint is dirt shows got to figure this out. They got to figure out the timing because that race didn't end until 1237 AM East coast time. When I say my eyes were heavy, I mean, guys, I was doing jumping jacks in my living room trying to stay awake for this. Uh, NASCAR fans are always like, oh, we can't have Sunday night races because I got to get up to work the next morning. The race ends at 10 o'clock. Like you can easily like just fall asleep at 1030 and like be totally fine. 1237, that's late. Like I didn't fall asleep until after one o'clock. And that was brutal. When that 6, 630 alarm clock comes around, you're just like, damn, this sucks. But yeah, just... It's a long show, right? Started at 6.30 for hot laps. Doesn't end until 12.37. So that's a six-hour show. NASCAR's talking about, like, oh, we want to th keep things under three hours. And dirt racing's like, fuck this. We're going to do six. It's just a marathon of a night. So, yeah, that's the only thing I would complain about. But other than that, fantastic event. Uh, excited to see it happen again. All right, F1 is in action this weekend as well at... Hungary, Daniel Ricardo is back, and this week we have the return of the Sporkle. I know, everybody's super excited about the Sporkle coming back, because I am. This week we are doing NASCAR winners, 2010s, so from 2010, and this says updated 2020. So I think it means that it's going to 2020, like through 2020, but... We'll find out together here um, as I get this set up here. So it's 14 minutes. I'm not doing 14 minutes. If I do have to do 14 minutes, I'm disappointed in myself and I will speed through this. But let's get this started in here. Not to quote the Black Eyed Peas, but uh, we did. So let's play the quiz. All right. Right off the top of the bat. We know Kevin Harvick has the most wins in this decade. Easy, easy pick if I can spell his name right. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, another easy one. The Brothers Bush. Uh, what did I put Kyle, Kurt, Bush, Denny Hamlin, uh, Matt Kenseth, Martin Truex Jr. People forget Martin Truex Jr. Twenty-seven wins in the last uh, in that decade. Brad Keselowski. Brad Keselowski is going to win this race. Famous Larry Mack quote. Joey Logano, two-time champion now, but during that period, one-time champion and Daytona 500 winner. Uh, did I use Jeff Gordon already? Jeff Gordon. Dale Earnhardt Jr. Tony Stewart. Can't forget about Tony Stewart. Casey Kane. Uh, Carl Edwards. People forget, Carl Edwards only had 12 wins in that decade. Granted, he did retire after 2016, but he also had eight wins in, I think, 2008. People people definitely forget that. Uh, I use Casey Kane. Mm, wait, can I just type in the last name? Vickers. Oh, hell yeah. We're moving along now. Elliot. Truex. Elliot. Uh, Larson. We know Trevor Bain won. David Reagan. Two-time winner, David Reagan. AJ Allmendinger. Uh, Montoya. Who else do we have? Eric Jones. Alex Bowman. Yep. All right. Think. We got to think here. Jamie McMurray. Greg Biffle. All right. Now we're getting down to the nitty-gritty. David Rudiman. People forget David Rudiman. That Chicago win. And then just kind of disappeared. I think he's just living in Florida now. So he went full Florida man, which is good for him. Marcos Ambrose. Name you've forgotten about for sure. Ryan Newman. Austin Dillon. Paul Menard, 2001 Brickyard 400. Jeff Gordon should have won that race. Paul Menard snuck one in there, which is kind of cool, I guess. Uh, did I use Eric Almarola? All right, Almarola's down. Did I use Clint Boyer already? 
I don't think so. Boyer, eight wins. All right, now we're down to the nitty gritty here. Cole Custer, William Byron, I think is one. All right, I spelled William wrong. That's embarrassing. If you're watching this, you can definitely see that I spelled Byron wrong. Haley. I spelled Haley like, I don't know, a girl's name. All right, four more. I got to think now real quick. We've got Paul Menard, Brian Vicker, Regan Smith. How's the name? Chris Busher, Pocono 2016. All right, we have two more to go. And now I gotta really rack my brain for this. I don't love this at all. Blaney is one. And then we have a two race winner. Who the heck could this possibly be? I use Eric Almarola. I used Eric Jones. Alex Bowman, Marcos Ambrose, David Reagan. I use Almendinger. I use Vickers already. Ah, oh, this is no good, you guys. This is no good. Who had two wins? I use David Reagan. Oh, I got it. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Hell yeah. All right. I think that took me four and a half minutes. Or five and a half minutes? I don't know. Either way, 100%. Look at that. Pumped up for it. All right. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, follow me on TikTok at Break Hard. Also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and threads at Break Hard Blog. I'll see you guys next week for another podcast.